Hello everyone, welcome to the editorial analysis of the Shankar AS Academy brought to you by the Civilspedia team. So this video is in for the current affairs for the date 19th of September 2024. The topics for discussion are as follows. The editorial article titled in Wilmington juxtaposing immediacy with legacy discusses about the uh, importance of Quad and their uh, fourth leadership meeting or the summit was conducted highlighting lot of issues like the climate change, Indo-Pacific region importance, maritime importance and so on. And the next article is about the one election, one nation approval by the union cabinet and uh, problems associated and uh, critics discourses and its advantages disadvantages associated with this. So, this article comes under the Indian Express and the Quad article comes under the Hindu. So, now without any much further delay, let us get into the article's discussion one by one. As an important news for the 2024, the union cabinet has accepted a high level commission's recommendation on conducting one election for the one nation. That is to hold simultaneous elections for one for one nation, one election for the state legislative assemblies, for the Lok Sabhas and other local bodies as in a phased manner after a countrywide consensus building exercises. So, before looking into the article discussion, let us see a main question. Discuss the advantages and challenges of implementing simultaneous elections in India. How can the government address the concerns raised by the various stakeholders regarding this electoral reform? So, in reference of this article, let us see the framework for this question. First, let us see what is simultaneous election. Uh, simultaneous election is nothing but holding Lok Sabha elections or uh, general elections and the state assembly elections together across India at the same time and this is known as the one nation, one election. So, here uh, previously it was practiced until 1967 where both the parliament elections and the state elections were conducted together but uh, due to various factors or reasons like the premature dissolutions of the state assemblies as well as the central governments have uh, led to the discontinuation of simultaneous elections and this simultaneous elections have been staggered since. Now, uh, let us look into the uh, legal backing up when it comes to simultaneous elections. So, when looking into the constitutional provisions and the laws related to it, there needs a lot of requirements of amendments when it comes to the law for simultaneous election. Here, the current constitutional provisions support separate and independent elections uh, for both the state uh, Lok Sabha and the state legislative assemblies. Thus, to have a simultaneous election, we need to have modifications or changes or amendments uh, in the following uh, constitutional provisions. So, let us see the constitutional provisions or articles related to it and the required change to it. Now, let us look at the constitution amendment when it comes uh, related to the elections. Here, article 83 sub clause 2 talks about the Lok Sabha's tenure uh, which is 5 years in nature unless dissolved earlier. Thus, keeping in mind of this tenure, if we need to conduct a simultaneous elections, this tenure need to be either shortened or extended depending on the election cycle uh, alignment with the state assemblies. Same way, Article 7, uh, 172 talks about the state legislative assemblies tenure, which is also 5 years unless uh, dissolved earlier. Here again, for us to have a simultaneous election, the tenure needs to be shortened, extended or made changes according to the uh, election cycle alignment with the Lok Sabha elections. Next is the article 85. Here it talks about the president's power to dissolve Lok Sabha. So, therefore, for the simultaneous elections of Lok Sabha and state le legislative assembly to happen in a simultaneous manner, there needs to be changes on the imposing of the president's rule. Same here with article 356 where it talks about the president's rule uh, imposing in the state. So, here again, there needs to be a changes in the president rule if there needs to be a simultaneous elections so that there is a synchronization of both the state level as well as the central level elections. Next is the article 174 where it talks about the dissolution of state assemblies and the convening of meetings that is the conducting sessions or meetings. So, in order to have a, a synchronized election, these meetings need to be in align with the Lok Sabha election meetings. And finally, when it comes to a law, the Representation of People Act of 1951 is important as this act governs the conduct of elections in country India. 
so problems like premature dissolutions or uh, timings or time having a certain timeline or managing the elections are to be uh, noted under this act so if we need to have a synchronized or a simultaneous elections the representation of people act of 1951 need to be revised uh, let us look at the uh, judgments related to when it comes to simultaneous elections first is the sr bommai versus the union of india 1994 case this landmark case uh, upheld the importance of the federal structure preventing the ar uh, arbitrary uh, dismissals of the state assemblies or the state governments here it reinforces the balance of power between the center and the state as this relationship is very crucial when it comes to the synchronization of elections next is the law commission's 170th report of the 1999 where uh, it uh, it proposed the idea of the simultaneous elections to avoid frequent electoral cycles and also it noted the extensive constitutional amendments which uh, need to be required when it comes to simultaneous uh, conducting simultaneous elections next is the election commission of india's 2015's recommendation here the report was submitted by the election commission to the law ministry where it suggested logistical and constitutional challenges when it comes to simultaneous elections the report emphasized on having a careful consideration before implementing uh, reforms related to synchronized elections now let us look into the advantages of having simultaneous elections first is the cost efficiency cost efficiency uh, having a significant savings on the logistical cost especially when it comes to elections it can have an impact so factors like polling staffs security and equipments can have a logistical savings as compared to many elections to one election next is the disrupt uh, reduced disruptions frequent election disrupts the governance and development work due to the model code of conduct as it holds many policy decisions thus having just one election can have reduced disruptions due to such activities next is having a streamlined governance there is more time for policy making and long term governance without the destruction of election campaigns as both the state and central will have more time for policy making next is the higher voter turnout comparing to many elections uh, if there is one election the citizens participating in the election for voting would be higher in nature compared to the ratio of citizens participating in simultaneous elections next is to have a focus on the developmental issues political parties uh, can have their shift of focus from short term electoral promises to more consistent and uh, long term developmental agendas are as it is only one election and not more frequent elections so the political parties need to be hold accountable for a longer period of time and for one time also next is the uh, reduced electoral fatigue both the citizens and the political parties would not be ex exhausted by continuous campaignings and rallies next is the efficient de uh, deployment of security forces if there is one election conducted there are more efficiency of deployment of security forces as when crimes are happening the uh, the rate of complaint can be found in one place and at the same time the resolutions can be given efficiently at one place next is curbing regionalism there is a scope for focusing on both the national issues as well as the local issues as there is fair representation through the one election now at the same time uh, after seeing the advantages we need to see the issues and challenges when it comes to simultaneous elections first is the impact on federalism having simultaneous elections could weaken the federal structure by centralizing the election process or there might be a fear that uh, there is dominance of the center over the state next is logistical challenges here coordinating elections for 543 lok sabha seats and almost 4120 state assembly seats would be complex so uh, compiling these many numbers for one election is such a task next is having frequent dissolution and bypolls uh, premature dissolutions would defeat the purpose of simultaneous elections of the lok sabha and the state legislative and next is the campaign dominance by the national parties the national parties may dominate the electoral narrative weakening the regional parties ideologies and their voice sometimes also now uh, so thus after seeing the issues and challenges let us have a look at the way forward when it comes to simultaneous elections 
first is having a consensus building so to have a simultaneous uh, elections we need to have a strong consensus and coordination from the state legislative assemblies and the political parties associated with this so to have so thus to build a political consensus and consulting the uh, required stakeholders along with the eci can reduce the backlash especially from the oppositions next is to have a judicial review there is a need to address the potential legal ch challenges when it comes to the constitutional provisions and laws so this judicial interpretation Interpretation can uh, help for simultaneous elections to fit in along with the constitutional backup. Next is to have a phased implementation. Gradual implementation of simultaneous election should be in a phased manner rather than having a phased election at the first. Having a phased implementation for the simultaneous election need to be focused. Next is having a logistical preparedness. Along with the polling staff, security and so on, when it comes to missionaries, that is the electoral missionary readiness, which uh, involves the adequacy of the electoral voting machines and voter verifiable paper audit trail units can be helped to increase the logistical preparedness. Thus, there is a smooth functioning of the simultaneous elections. So, uh, next is the voter awareness when it comes to campaigns here. We need to educate the voters about the new system, especially in those phased implementation programs. Next is to have a pilot project. As India is a diverse country, we need to test the frameworks in selected areas and we can't intrusively include simultaneous election suddenly especially for 21st century as this practice has been conducted before 19 uh, during the 1960s so now having a simultaneous election with different kind of population need to be considered properly and finally is to have a legal safeguard here uh, developing contingency plans for midterm dissolutions of both Lok Sabha and the state legislative assembly need to be handled so that the election cycle can be monitored so moving to this article, the article discusses about the Quad's uh, fourth leader summit which was conducted in the Wilmington, Delaware where uh, the Quad members have raised their concerns on uh, highlighting their significance among amid the uh, leadership transitions and at the same time other global challenges. So issues when it comes to the Indo-Pacific integration, maritime security, uh, regional sec and regional stability uh, were a focus of this quad meeting and other issues like the uh, maritime domain awareness, advan advancing the global supply chain uh, resilience and other issues like the climate change, uh, security, infrastructure development and other sustainable projects uh, were key discussions in the meeting. So in reference with the article, let us see what a quad is all about. But before that, let us move to a mains practice question. Discuss the role of quad in ensuring stability in the Indo-Pacific region. What are the challenges and opportunities uh, India has when it comes to quad? So, in reflection of this question, let us see what Quad is holistically and uh, let us understand India's placement when it comes to Quad. Quad, known as the Quadrilateral Security Domain, was first emerged as a group for the, re, uh, for the regional security in the Indo-Pacific region. So, uh, let us look into the origins of Quad. Uh, Quad were emerged as a group post the 2024 disaster of the Indian, Indian Ocean Tsunami. Thus, countries involving India, Japan, Australia and the US came in together to aim uh, for uh, having a aimed coordination for the disaster relief management efforts when it comes to uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Thus, the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe made a formal visit to India with the proposal of creating a formal quad in 2007. Thus, the group quad was formed uh, along with a regional security to have a broader security which was driven by shared concern over the China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific region. So after the formation of the Quad, there was a few initial setback during the 2018 to 2017. Here uh, in 2018, Australia withdrew from the Quad group due to domestic and uh, external pressures, especially particularly from the China. Thus, uh, until 2017, Quad remained uh, inactive. There were a lot of bilateral and trilateral relations continued among the Quad.
but there weren't any uh, formal dialogue properly. So in 2017, the revival of the Quad was very strong, again due to the broader security reasons which is the concerns about the China's assertiveness when it comes to the South China Sea as well as the Indian Ocean. The reason stood as a uh, revival opportunity of the Quad by the four countries. Thus, the uh, revival was formalized by the meeting of the four countries during the sidelines of the uh, ASEAN summit which happened in the 2017 in Philippines. This marked the return of the Quad in the geopolitical context. Now, let us see the objectives of the Quad. They are pretty straightforward. So, I think for the viewers, it would be easy to understand the objectives. Now, first, in keeping in mind of the Indian Pacific region, uh, the objectives were made in made into thus ensuring of the peace, stability, and promotion of the uh, Indian Pacific region was their main component. So, first objective is to have a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific region. So, there is ensuring of freedom of navigation and overflight when it comes to the region as they wanted to uphold a rules-based international order, especially when it comes to maritime. Thus, the Quad supported the United Nations Conventions on the Law of Sea or the UNCLOS. Next is to strengthening the regional security as this reason was the prior reason on the formation of the Quad. Here it helped uh, focused on enhancing the maritime security that is the maritime domain awareness which is nothing but having a awareness on all components when it comes to maritime such, such as the fishing, such as the threats, uh, such as the ships and so on and also uh, involving of the monitoring of sea lines and their protection were given focus. Next is to address uh, activities like the counter terrorism, next is to address the activities like cyber security and other non traditional security issues like the piracy and so on uh, was a great focus for the Quad members when it comes to the global context. Next is to have an economic cooperation and infrastructure. The Quad try to improve, have a regional connectivity through the infrastructure investment, digital economy and other technological advancements like the open uh, RAN or RAN which is the radio access network so that uh, the flowing of data would uh, would never be a hurdle. Next is to promote a supply chain resilience in critical sectors which include semiconductors, pharmaceuticals and other rare earth minerals. Next is to have an advanced focus in the critical and emerging technologies. So collaboration on the uh, artificial intelligence, 5G, quantum computing, biotechnology and so on made sure that there is involvement of technological use in the objectives of Quad also. Especially after uh, internet was a thing during the 2017. So making use of the uh, technological advancements helped in the assurance of the larger perspectives or larger goals of the quad and next is to ensure ethical use of these technologies so that the there is a countering of the authoritative misuse of when it comes to the technology and next is the humanitarian as a quad standing as a humanitarian assistance and disaster relief management here the main reason for the quad to happen is due to the uh, unfortunate incident of the Indian Ocean Tsunami of 2024. So, one of the major objective of Quad is to have a coordinate responses when it comes to natural disasters and crises are as the Indian Pacific region is almost maritime in nature and next to strengthen regional capacity for managing emergencies and other climate change concerns. Now let us look into the significance of Quad when it comes to India. First is to have a balancing China's influence. So Quad, uh, so for India, Quad can be a platform to counter China's assertiveness in China, in the China border and the Indian Ocean, as projects like the South China Sea and uh, Belt Road Initiative can stand as a hurdle for India. So Quad would be a good platform to counter the assertiveness of China. Next for India, uh, there is uh, enhancement of their regional and global influences. Quad helps for India to have a geopolitical standing as it also aligns with India's act east 
policy and regional cooperation goals thus in the southeast asian region india can have their representation next is the economic cooperation and supply chain resilience as i told before for a country like india uh, being a member of quad can help to reduce its dependence on china in when it comes to critical sectors such as the pharmaceutical and uh, semiconductors therefore it strengthens the manufacturing capabilities capabilities and economic partnership where there is uh, involvement of investments from other countries also so the next significance is when it comes to defense and security cooperation here uh, joint military exercise like the malabar navy exercise helps in the uh, interoperability that is ability of conducting military ex exercises between groups which helps for defense preparedness and at the same time there is uh, we as a country can trust other country or members of the quad countries if any critical endangerments uh, would be coming to india next is the global health security collaboration on vaccine distribution during the covid time especially it helped india's to have uh, an impact on the healthcare infrastructure and so on so so uh, issues like out of uh, pocket expenses and so on can be ad addressed with the uh, investments and aid and sorry healthcare aid when it comes to quad from different countries now like uh, let us look at the challenges when it comes to quad so especially for india here india takes more cautious approach uh, towards china as it is the we are the, our neighbor and at the same time japan and australia are, are uh, aligned with the us whereas india has a non aligned statement when it comes to us so these bilateral and trilateral relationships can sometime hurdle india as a stand next is to have a lack of institutional structure here this informal grouping doesn't uh, with no secretariat or uh, having a permanent framework can be difficult for any policies to be streamlined properly thus it limits the uh, long term strategies and or long term goals and to have a swift crisis response next challenge is the global uncertainty in indo pacific not only china but also uh, north korea's nuclear ambitions uh, russia's russia's increasing role in asia and us and china's rivalry can also be a problem for us and next is the global shifts and changing us policy when it comes to the four countries of course us has its uh, more authoritativeness and its control thus quad success can be sometimes tied to us foreign policy thus uh, shifts in the us leadership may alter the focus on the indo pacific region and finally is the limited military collaboration uh, other than malabar uh, navy military there are no formal military alliances or mutual defense commitment where there is no frequent or phased uh, such exercises thus having a varied military capabilities and defense priorities can complicate our coordination thus for conclusion uh, quad enhances india's security economic interest and at the same time geopolitical influence so uh, quad also helps india to have a counterbalance with china and strengthens uh, regional leadership for in the area of indo pacific and at the same time not just china but also with other uh, countries thank you for watching the video don't forget to give a like comment and a share and to further not to miss any other contents subscribe to our channel thank you and have a nice day